Hello? Yeah, we're starting now. We're starting, right? Yeah. Should we? Yeah, clap it up for week two. Let's go, clap. Yeah. Another, another RIT SEC meeting. All right. Please sign in. Yep. Same as always. Please sign in. Sign in at RITSEC.club, or you can scan the QR code so we know who's here, who participates, stuff like that. And you can be actually considered a club member when you sign in, so that's cool. You can also get Pete. <laughs> no, you can't. Um, <laughs> on to the announcements. Uh, if you are not in the Discord already, please join the Discord. That's discord.rtsec.club. This is where we chat, we update things, there's announcements. You can talk with all the men, like all the different interest groups and stuff like that. So uh, make sure to check that out if you're not already in that. Uh, we have a calendar, calendar.rtsec.club. This is where you can see all the upcoming events, uh, any interest groups when they meet, stuff like that. So if you want to keep up to date and be on time, look at the calendar. Uh, yeah, check that out. We have a mailing list if you want to get the newsletter every week, which will give you everything from the research topics that are being presented that week, all the news, upcoming events, anything you need to know about the club. Uh, that's mailed at rtsec.club or that QR code. Subscribe. You'll get that fun newsletter every week. It's got everything. Um, we have an anonymous feedback form if you would like to give any anonymous feedback for any reason. It is feedback.ritsec.club. Uh, we read it. So, yeah. If you need it, it's there. And uh, do uh, contagion? Uh, are you are you talking about contagion? Yes. Oh, okay. Oh my goodness. Okay. Okay. This is unnecessary. First up. Oh my goodness. <laughs> let's clap for Chandy's birthday today. Woo! Happy birthday, Chandy! Okay, so uh, we're here to talk about a little bit about Team Contagion. Okay, so Team Contagion, again, is our CTF team. Um, so we meet every Wednesday from 6.30 to 7.30 in the air gap. And we have a lot of fun, you know, a little bit of a, we do some cyber start, if you guys have heard about that. And we have those, uh, like, hag night type sessions to kind of, you know, uh, work on stuff and do some research. It's, it's really fun. It's really cool. Our first CTF is going to be DICE CTF which will be on the same weekend as the Hackathon. Um, so if you want to you know, get a little bit of taste of CTF, you know, come stop by. We'll be there at the Hackathon as well. Hackathon yes, and so. Yes. So since there's no team limit signs, we welcome everybody and anybody for the CTF. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Hope to see you there. Yes, anyone see? Oh. Okay. okay. We're Why done. are you bozos even here then? All right. Thank you for that nice Team Contagion announcement. There we go. Why are you here now? Oh, my goodness. <laughs> yeah, um, if you guys like red teaming, just add the role, and you get all the information on how to be badass like the red team. So um, please, please do so. Thank you. Nothing special. Are there any other interest groups that added slides that I don't know about? Okay, good. Um, all right. Uh, if you bought swag, please come to the club room and find an eBoward member to pick it up. We will check you off the list, make sure you've paid everything like that, and you can pick up your sweatshirt, shirt, or whatever else. I think that's it. <laughs> your sweatshirt or shirt. So, yeah. If you have not picked up your merch, please do so. Oh, are you? Yeah, we got an ISTS announcement from Allison. Colon... Capital O. Thank you for that clarification. Um, anyways, yeah, so signups are open for both blue team and white team. So if you haven't already, please sign up. We have two slots open, not including the reserve spot for the IRSEC team. Um, if you were the IRSEC winning team, please email me if you do want to compete. Um, I need to verify that. Don't use the blue team form. Um, but yes, please do sign up. Uh, it's going to be a really exciting time. Um, as you guys may know, ISTS is an advanced purple team competition. Uh, we're inviting 12 schools externally, and then we have three RIT teams. So it's going to be a really fun time. Uh, it's going to be held uh, March 4th through 6th. Currently, we're planning for in-person, um, so fingers crossed about that. But um, if your team isn't chosen at the end of the month, um, as again, we're only selecting two teams, and we have a bunch of teams signed up, white team sign-ups will remain open for like half of February. 
So if you don't get in, but you still want to participate in ISTS, do sign up for White Team because you still get that exposure, and it's a really fun time. Um, so yep, check out announcements for the forum or go to ists.io to sign up under, um, under 2022, I believe. So yeah, hope to see you there. Clap it up for ISTS. Thank you, Allison. All right. Uh, do you, oh, you're going to come up too? Okay. Why are there? That's a lot of QR codes, man. Yeah. All right. So, hello. one's also being blocked on stream. <laughs> Dang. All right. Hello, everybody. My name is Jason. I'm the CTF organizer for the RTTF happening on April 1st, not April 12th or whatever it was before. Um, this is not a prank, by the way. This is actually happening on April 1st. Um, so if you're interested in writing a, writing a challenge, fill out the, the form on the left, my left, your right, um, and that'll get you, that'll get me your kind of information so I can reach out to you guys, check in on you guys, give you guys help if you need it. If you want to commit to writing a challenge and you're actually going to do it, um, they're going to be due by March 17th. So fill out the form on the right. And if you don't know where to start at all, f scan the form, or I guess scan the document in the middle and get a little guide on how to write a challenge and figure it out. If you have any questions, DM me on Discord, send me an email, or yeah, just do all that. Um, yeah, we're going to be running our next challenge, Hack Night, on February 10th. It's going to be a... Maybe, might move it to a Wednesday, maybe, maybe February 9th. Thursdays are kind of busy now, so uh, yeah. I'm going to hackathon. Is that it? No, I got a hackathon. Next slide. Oh. Hackathon's happening on the 5th of February, so get ready to do some, do some work uh, in a lab on a Saturday. It'll be a great time. We'll be upstairs having a fun time hacking away. Um, just come join us. We're running from uh, 10 to 10, so 10 a.m., 10 p.m., we're going to be doing a lot of hacking. Be there or be square if you're a square because you're never around. Ooh. Yeah, run back to your seat. Okay. Uh, I think that's it for... Wh what is this? I didn't... Oh, my goodness. He's coming back. You, what did you forget? Because I'm busy. <laughs> All right. Um, is this anybody's first time coming to RIT Sec? Can we give them a big round of applause for coming here? <laughs> Welcome to RIT Sec. Thank you for coming. Enjoy. Learn a lot. Have a great time. Thank you for giving everyone on the stream ear damage when you clapped with the mic. Um, all right. <laughs> yeah. Enough of Jason. Thank you, though. Um, <laughs> we have some upcoming events, as you have previously heard about. Uh, Hackathon, then we have the RIT Sec Career Fair Eve. We'll discuss more about that when it gets close, if you don't know what that is. We have our ISTS, which is our big red-blue CTF Capture the Hill competition. Um, ShmooCon, so we'll all be heading down to that. And then we have the CTF in April, so fair amount of events there. Yes, it's, it's busy times. All right. Let's clap it up for sponsors. Thank you, we love them. All right, uh, social media. Uh, this is very actually active now, so please check it out. Thank you, Claire. Um, follow all of our social media. Yeah, we post there all the time if you want to see fun images of events and stuff. Yeah. All right, on to this week's education topic. Uh, it is Advanced Windows with Enzo the Stefano. Clap it up. Yeah! Thank you, Tansu. Windows, Windows, Windows moment. Yes, I'm destroying the mic right now. All right, what's up, everybody? Uh, we did advanced Lindo, uh, Linux last week, uh, so this is much better talk. I don't know where Michael Vaughn is. I was going to point at him, but he's not here. I'm getting booze. Sad. Okay, Windows is awesome. All right, so I have a lot of things I want to cover today, and some of it is going to be a little complex and might go over your head. Um, but just ask questions at the end and let me know. Um, this is some cool stuff. So here's a little table of contents of stuff we're going to do. Uh, we're going to go over a bit of an overview of what Windows is again. 
some basics. It's been since last semester since we did the basic Windows talk. Uh, we're going to talk about the Windows file system. We're going to talk about ACLs and permissionings uh, uh, files again. Uh, we're going to talk about organization, how Windows is organized. We're going to talk about authentication, so three aspects, the tokens, NTLM authentication, and Kerberos authentication. Um, we're going to talk about services again. Uh, we're going to talk about drivers this time. Um, and we're going to talk a little bit about programming for Windows, because there's a lot you got to know there. And then lastly, we're going to bring up uh, WMI, which is a certain protocol. We love WMI. OK, so what is sort of the deal with Windows? Uh, it's pretty popular. Um, and I kind of generalize it into four categories um, of why people use it. You got one, complexity, two, legacy, three, stability, and four, ease of use. And I say sometimes because that sort of applies to all of these here. It's sometimes complex, sometimes easy to use, it's sometimes stable, and it's always legacy. So if I could generalize it, it's very legacy focused. Um, and that's what companies really like about Windows, is that you can use, you can run the same code on Windows 2012 server as you can on Windows 2022 server, or Windows 2000, or whatever. That stuff just works. So a lot of companies uh, use this technology called Active Directory. Um, it sort of makes, it's a general structure of how to organize your networks, um, all your users and things like that. Um, it makes lives much easier, although it is extremely vulnerable, and there's a new vulnerability every week on it. Um, but we'll talk about that later. Um, so if you have a good grasp on this stuff, it makes your resume really stand out. Because if you do AD pen testing or you know about Windows stuff, everybody uses Windows. So that's a good thing. And like I was saying above, um, it's very popular. And you can either be a power user and you know, expand your functionality and you know, dive deep into Windows programming. Or even if you know, normal people use Windows too. So it's good for both. And it kind of has a wide range of whatever, however much you want to do. Um, one of the things that's very popular now is Windows Server ISOs. Um, those have been increasing in popularity, and they also provide a thing called Windows Core, which is basically Windows without the GUI. And a lot of people hate Windows Core, but I like it. So um, I usually get shot for that. Um, OK, let's talk about the file system. So there's a couple of main formats that you might recognize and have seen before. So the first is FAT slash FAT32 and XFAT. So FAT32 is the older one. This is usually what flash drives come prepackaged with. Um, one of the limitations with FAT32 is it can only hurt, hold uh, 32 gigabytes on a flash drive. So obviously not pretty good um, there. So they developed XFAT in like 2006, I believe it was, um, to fight the data size limitations on that one. So now you'll see most flash, flash drives um, running XFAT. It's also uh, very um, applicable to other systems, too. So you can run it on Windows, Mac OS, and Linux. Um, not the case with NTFS, which is what we're going to talk about. This is Windows' uh, main file system that it uses here. Um, that stands for New Technology File System. Um, it has no realistic data size limitations. like. I think the, the max is like eight petabytes or eight exabytes or something. You would never, ever fill that much space, hopefully. Um, so they fixed that issue with NTFS. And the second thing is all the files on the system have access control lists. I'm going to go over a whole slide on this. Um, another thing was they have alternate data streams, too. So I put this diagram up here. And if you could see, there's a fat file up here. And it has you know, your attributes, your metadata and the actual data that you're storing on the disk or you know, whatever. And then for NTFS, it has the attributes. It's called a resource file on, uh, in Windows. But that's just the metadata, who wrote it, that stuff. And then it has the security. So those are those ACLs, those access control lists. And then it has these things called streams. So there's the main stream, which is when you open up a text file and you type in you know, whatever you want to type in, save that file. An alternate stream is if you want to write different data to the same file under the same file name, you can do that. So not many use cases for this, but 
that's a possibility as well. So I'll go into that a little bit more, uh, or go into ACLs on the next slide. Um, here are some common format or uh, ex extensions you're going to see on um, Windows. So the first is obviously a .exe. If you see a .exe on Linux, uh, yikes, <laughs> that's not real. Um, it's in a format called Portable Executable, or PE format. Uh, it has a bunch of headers. There's a whole, you could, that could be a whole talk of its own. Uh, the next thing is a DLL, or uh, .so on Linux. Um, this is just a library of uh, additional code that you can load and call, and I'll talk about that later too. Um, there's also .bat files and .cmd files. So these are just, uh, the main script engine in uh, Windows is CMD command line, whatever you want to call it, and those are the extensions for that. And then, of course, PS1, PowerShell. I'll talk about this stuff later. Um, so going back, I want to talk a little bit about Windows Boot, too. There's two main modes. Like, if you ever go into the BIOS when you're on your Windows system, you've got UEFI and Legacy BIOS mode. Legacy BIOS is obviously the Legacy Edition. It works. It's very stable, um, but, you know, it's a bit older. Uf UEFI is the newer one. And it uses, there's these two technologies here. There's master boot record and GPT, which I think is GUID partition table. Um, MBR has a limitation of, I believe, two terabytes um, for that. So if you want your disk size to be more than two terabytes, you gotta go with GPT. But everything is standard, usually UEFI nowadays. But you will see these two, and they might be mentioned. That could be a whole talk. And your boot information is kept in this boot.ini file. So all the information for when you're booting on Windows, it's kept in this boot.ini file. So uh, one last thing is uh, files are often signed with a certif certificate. So just to verify its authenticity and that it's a real file, it's not malicious, most files on Windows are signed. So. If I just throw some random executable on a system and it's not signed, obviously Windows is going to have an issue with that because unsigned executables are now running, especially when it's accessing strange things and you know it's like ransomware or whatever. Okay, so let's go over ACLs again. Um, an ACL access control list is made up of access control entries. So each ACE identifies the group or person and describes their associated rights. So there's three types. There's allow, deny, and audit. So general rules to follow when permissioning is deny rules will most always override allow rules. Um, permissions are inherited, but explicit rules that you set will override. So if I create a folder and I don't have write access to it, if I create a file in that folder, that file will also not have write access to it. But if I explicitly say that I can write to this file, then I can write to that, but I can't write to the directory. So explicit rules. And the last thing, and this is something you'll see in all your networking classes and everything, order matters. So it, it'll go from top to bottom. I don't have a picture of the thing, but um, it'll put groups at the top and then go down. So it'll parse that list as such. So if you have a deny at the top for everyone, it'll deny everyone. So. Most objects on Windows have ACLs, um, but modification methods might vary. So if you're trying to modify a file, it's very easy. You just right click, hit security, and you can modify it. It'll pop up this window right here, and you can click whatever one you want. Um, for services, you have to do a whole different six syntax called SDDLs. I think I gave a talk on it during the basic talk. Um, but basically, everything sort of has permissions, but it just might be a little more difficult to get to them. And your main interaction uh, for editing permissions is this tool called iCackles. It was previously Cackles, um, but that was deprecated. And then there's the PowerShell commandlet, which is super easy to use if you just go on MSDN. So let's talk about a bit of the organizational structure on Windows. So it goes uh, from left to right, bigger, biggest to smallest. It goes from session, station, desktop, window, process, and thread. So a session is just consisting of all the processes and all the system objects. It's like the big general thing, um, where a station is the security boundary between the desktop and the processes. So it's crossing those off, the little diagram there. So when we talk about desktops, and this is interesting, there are four main desktops on Windows. So you have your Win logon, which is your lock screen, your logon screen. You have your actual desktop where you do everything. 
you have secure desktop for UAC and the screensaver. So when the message pops up on your system where it says, hey, are you administrator? Would you like to do this action? You're actually on a different desktop. It'll just take a screenshot of your current desktop, like blur it out a little while putting you on a separate desktop. So it's a different context and it makes it more secure. So talking about processes and threads, um, processes aren't actually, um, they don't actually do much. Those are just the metadata for the actual threads running it. So everything is handled by the threads. Processes are just that face that you click on, task manager and everything. All right, let's talk about authentication. So local authentication <laughs> is handled by the local security authority um, or LSAS, local security authentication, authority subsystem service. Um, you'll see this process on uh, all your systems on Windows and you know, Red Team sometimes does the ISAS, capital ISAS. That's a classic. Um, so when you log in, LSAS is going to create a token for you to use, and this is how you are verified on Windows. So it's called an access token, and this token is used as an identifier uh, to the logon session. So when you want to create processes um, and authenticate in any sort of way, you need to use this token that you are given. So the Security Account Manager, or SAM database, stores all your account information. So that's where your hashed passwords are and everything. And LSAS will get the information from there. So there's that communication between the two main things for Windows. There are two types of access tokens. There's the primary uh, token, which is granted when you log in by LSAS, and then there's the impersonation. So say you need to be, um, you need to act as a service or something else on a system. So you need to log in as a different user, or you want to, uh, with like the run as command, or you want to be system, um, thinking like PS exec. Um, it sort of is, you are impersonating the system token, but you're not actually the system user. So you're able to sort of use their token for a bit for whatever you need to do. And lastly, uh, tokens have special privileges associated with them. So um, this is a little blurry, but um, there are special permissions that allow you to do special things um, that are associated with each token. So if you want to change the time zone or set the time you want to back up your device or restore or shut down. There are uh, specific uh, things associated with your token. Okay, let's talk about NTLM authentication. So as I said, uh, new technology, land managers, NTLM. It is a challenge-based response authentication protocol um, deployed on all Windows systems for backwards compatibility. It's considered insecure. Um, it's a bit outdated and it's vulnerable to pass the hash. So a bit of a run through quickly. Um, the user will send their domain information and username in clear text to the server. Uh, the server will generate this 16 byte random uh, thing called a challenge um, and send it to the client. Um, yes, okay. So the user uh, will input their password and then that password is hashed. So as soon as you put in your password and it's hashed, they dump the password so it's not stored anywhere and it can't be stolen. So the only thing that exists is a hash. And the challenge is actually encrypted with the hash. So it'll send that hash to the server and then pull that information from the SAM database and then encrypt the challenge with the hash. If the uh, user's challenge and the server's challenge both match, that's authentication pass. So, so we talked a bit about Active Directory, and that's called being on a domain. So they will use Kerberos instead of NTLM. So um, let's see here. My throat's all dried up. <laughs> Give me a second. Uh, OK. Network authentication protocol. Um, I'm going to skip this slide. Let's just go through this. Um, the client will send this thing called a Ticket Granting Ticket, or TGT, uh, to a key distribution center. So, oh, good lord. Let me get some water quick, and I'll come back. I've done, okay, this has happened to me before, so.
Yes, clap for me, I just drank water. <laughs> yes, H2O. <laughs> okay, um, I'll take it a little slower. Uh, so the uh, TGT is created for the client and they pull the password from the SAM database to encrypt that um, as the key. And the client will enter their creds to decrypt that encrypted TGT. And if it's decrypted properly, it'll keep that TGT as proof of ID. So they use this TGT to get something called a ticket granting service. So whenever they want to interact with a service or do anything on Windows, they need to use your TGT to get a TGS. And that will be permission for them to do whatever. So there are ways to forge tickets, golden ticket attacks, and silver ticket attacks exist. Um, if you have certain things, you can generate your own TGT without actually, um, basically, you're creating it for a phantom account on Windows. So golden ticket attacks are huge in AD pen testing. And there's also forging silver tickets as well, which is just forging a TGS. So Windows services. Um, everything on Windows is managed by the SCM. There are a couple different uh, big accounts on Windows, the trusted installer, local system, local service, network service. Um, local system is similar to the root account on Linux or Unix, and trusted installer is used to install Windows components. So most of the time you're not logging in as trusted installer. Uh, most services are managed with the SC command line tool and you'll see SVC host running all the time. So services also have permissions. We talked about that, SDDLs. And all data is stored in the HGLM hive in the registry, so watch out for that. Drivers, okay. Um, this is in kernel land, so ring zero. This is the lowest you can possibly go. Um, in terms of you get more access, but you, it is much more difficult to program these things, and um, there are a lot of security implications as well. Um, bypassing Windows driver signing is very difficult, so uh, this is the first thing that people will look for is a malicious driver. It's very easy to spot. And if you're trying to debug a driver, it's also very difficult. Um, you need two machines. So you need your machine you're testing the live driver on, and you need the machine that you were running uh, WinDebug on. So are you running WinDebug on the other both machines, whatever. Um, basically, while you're debugging this driver, you have to proxy all of the output from the machine you're testing on to a separate machine, because you can't live debug the kernel uh, on the same system. It just doesn't work like that. That's, it's too low level. So. That's something to watch out for. Drivers are very difficult to write. So programming in Windows. Um, there are a bunch of different things that you can do. Uh, the PowerShell scripting language. Batch is that CMD language. There's C Sharp, which is, if you know Java, you know C Sharp. Um, there's Visual Basic and Visual Basic Script. And C, of course, C and C++. And there's pros and cons to everything. <coughs> So the .NET framework is a collection of APIs um, and shared code that C Sharp and PowerShell interface with. Very easy to understand and use. 
um, but you don't get that full access that you would get with C++ or anything like that. So say I want to you know, run an executable in C Sharp. It's very easy. You just create a process. Um, if you're executing commands, you can use shell ex execute. You get the file name of what you want to execute, if you want to create a window or not, and then start the process. Super easy. And all this is documented on MSDN. So Win API. Uh, this is much lower level. Um, it provides you with more uh, information, but it takes a lot more. Um, you have to manage your own memory, which is very difficult sometimes. And um, on the other side, it's more lightweight and much faster than C Sharp. <coughs> I'm dying again. Um, so function calls will either end in an A or a W with Windows. So you see load library A. Um, I shouldn't put it. There's also load library W. It depends on what type of strings you want to use. There's ANSI strings, which have 8-bit characters, and Unicode strings, uh, which has 16-bit characters. So some common calls are load library, uh, get proc address, WSA something, startup star, and create process. So <clears throat> if you want to use a DLL, you have to load it with load library. And that'll get you a handle to the library. And if you want to call a function from that DLL, you have to use get proc address. And that'll use that handle and get the process name. And then you can execute that uh, function from the library. WSA, whatever, is all the methods used in the WinSock. So if you want to create a socket, do anything networking related, you need that. And then create process as well. I'll show you that for C++. Um, quick aside on uh, DLL search order. So if you don't provide a full path to your DLL for load library, Windows will search for you. They'll go down this list of, uh, of places and look for the DLL if, you, if it can't find it. So it's another backup. So obviously a little more difficult with uh, creating a process, um, C++. These are all the parameters required for C++ versus that of C Sharp. Much easier. So <coughs> let's talk about the native API. So sometimes it's referred to as the hidden or secret API. That's not really true. Uh, they don't care if you use it, but they just don't want people to use it. Um, they don't document it very well because sometimes these will get you access to things you're not really supposed to see. Um, but it's harder to find, so you have to put a little more effort into this. So <coughs> here's a little uh, example. NT query system information. So this is a function in ntdll.dll. Um, this is an internal function. This is the function that task manager uses on the back end to query all of the processes running on your system. So theoretically, if you are malicious, you can use this function call and hook it such that processes don't show up in task manager. So it's a little harder. You have to find out, like, this is a whole custom struct that might not show up on MSDN. Like, we were lucky enough that this showed up, but certain things might not. And you need to do a little research and try and find out how these things work. So, so last thing, uh, we're going to talk a bit about WMI. Um, this is the thing that I use in the labs when I'm putting calculators on your, all your uh, systems or putting messages boxes. So um, this is a bit of a framework. It's a local and remote management tool. It's built into Windows. Um, it's used to query system information often um, with SQL-like language. Um, I think I have an example on the next slide. So the general format, if you just want the basics, it's WMIC, pass your credentials, area, and then the query string. <coughs> so that's for remote systems or elevating. So if I want to create calc.exe on my system and run that, then I do WMIC, the process module, call create calc.exe. Pretty simple. If you want to run a command, it'd be cmd slash c command. So from a security perspective, um, you can do these things called WMI events. So <coughs> WMI will respond to events happening. They run as system, so highest privileges on the uh, system. 
Um, but they show up in auto runs, so don't really use them if you're trying to you know, not get caught. So there are three things required for a WMI event. There's the filter, the consumer, and the filter to consumer binder. So the filter is uh, determining what the event is that it wants to trigger on, while the consumer is what happens if that event happens. So the biggest one is a command line event consumer, where it'll run a command if you do something. There's, a different, there's different ones, though. And the filter to consumer bind is the mechanism that will just bind the tool, the two. <coughs> so here's an example. Um, like we said with SQL, we have select star, just like SQL, from something within 10 seconds where it is a logged on user. And then uh, the consumer is just running a PowerShell script that writes to a file. And then you bind the two down there. So that's WMI. It's pretty easy to use. You can do it with CMD, PowerShell, or in C Sharp or C++ too. So, okay, that was a lot, and my throat is so dry. It's ridiculous. So, any questions? Um, please, please do the demo. Download it now. It's 17 gigabytes. Me and Max finished it at midnight last night. It was just not working. So, who's got questions? Yes, Jacob. Oh, that hurts. Uh, I, can I say no comment? Yeah. Say no comment. Yes, ends with thumbs down emoji. Yes. Can you say it again? I would download it now. I'm not doing anything live. That is a, okay, this is a, this is a firing shot at me, because during CCDC, I was trying to run WMI commands to get back into a system I was locked out of, but I was mistyping it, so they never let it off me um, for that, very sad. Yes. <coughs> what was that? That doesn't work, but if you can run LS on PowerShell. Ah. Or you could do NCMD, PowerShell, Taxi, LS. Big brain. Yes. Uh, I would guess probably a month minimum, maybe more. Drivers take a lot of time. Uh, one thing on WMI, if you want to know all about WMI for red and blue team or just security in general, I gave a whole talk. It's on the Red Tech uh, YouTube. I think it's like 40 minutes of just WMI as a topic. So if you want that, head over there. All right, any other questions? All right, if not, thank you guys for bearing with my voice and everything. I swear this always happens when I present. Thank you.